Okay, well, we'll probably get started now. Uh, morning, everybody, and welcome to this CEF webinar in association with our legal patron, Mills Selig. Delighted to have Emma Hunt and Connor Milligan with us from Mills Selig this morning. They're going to take us through PropTech, which is an overview of legal issues on the use of drones and related technology in the construction sector. Uh, the way we'll go about this is, I think the guys will take 40 or 45 minutes or so to run through their presentation, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. If you, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, hover over the Q&A function, please feel free to submit any questions through that function at any point during the webinar, and then Emma and Connor, all being well, will seek to address those at the end. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Emma, uh, and uh, good morning. Good morning, um, and thanks, David. Um, on behalf of Mel Selig, I'd like to welcome everybody to this webinar on PropTech, and specifically um, the overview of legal issues on the use of drones and related technology. Uh, we're delighted to be able to present uh, in conjunction with the Construction Employers Federation. Um, by way of an introduction, I am a partner in the litigation department of Mel Selig, um, and I work across a number of different litigation areas, but quite specifically on media work and also on property litigation. Uh, my colleague Connor, who joins me today, works on uh, contentious and non-contentious construction issues. And in the course of uh, both of our practice areas, we have seen um, and increased demand from clients on uh, requiring advice on uh, drones uh, becoming more prevalent in the construction sector and in other sectors. Um, so we thought this might be a useful overview for you this morning. Um, so uh, in relation to the topics that we will cover today, um, there are sort of four specific areas that we're looking at. Drone technology, specification, use and regulation, um, legal issues arising out of the use of drones, um, Connor's then going to uh, cover a specific overview of drones in the construction industry um, and practical advice uh, for the use of drones uh, while min minimizing your risk of doing so. So um, I, I suspect on the uh, webinar today, um, we will have a sort of a range of people who have who maybe use drones every day in, in the course of your work, some that might be quite new and just thinking about using the technology. So it might be fairly obvious, but uh, just to sort of confirm that the definition of a drone is an aircraft without a human pilot on board, but instead is controlled remotely through pre-flight and on-flight programming and operation. <clears throat> so um, moving on to then sort of the use of drones beyond the sort of recreational use or the use as toys really, um, we are seeing it uh, appearing in a number of sectors, and these are the types of um, sectors and work areas in which it's becoming more prevalent. Um, you will be very aware of it being used in sort of filming and commercial photography, um, but it's becoming more prevalent in surveillance, cartography, and sort of more specifically for the construction industry, I suppose, surveying, land management, and installation inspection. Um, and then there's a few sort of more specific or bespoke uh, areas which it's used in in terms of search and rescue, chemical and biological detection, and then also in the field of agriculture. So why would you use a drone? Um, well, um, I think there are sort of four main reasons why you might consider it and specifically consider it in the construction industry. Um, ease of access, if you can imagine, you know, areas that are difficult to reach, areas that are difficult to reach safely, uh, working at height and things like that. Um, you, so, it's, so ease of access is very closely aligned with safety as well, which is another sort of advantage of using drones. Um, as well as that time, obviously, um, the time that it takes to sort of fire a drone up um, is much less than maybe uh, setting up a, a site safely um, and, and in particular reaching a very sort of inhospitable or, or difficult area to reach. Um, with the advancement of the technology, it's also sort of fair to say that you can capture very good quality data um, with the advancement of the camera technology on board and all of that. Um, so that, that's also a, a, a really good advantage. Um, in terms of the, uh, the cost after you have the initial capital investment in the technology and the pilot, and we'll come on to discuss the sort of the operational and the, uh, the regulatory requirements around that. After that initial investment, 
um, it's obviously a lot less costly to, um, to, to use a drone in certain instances. So those are the things that you might think about when considering whether to introduce them into the course of your business every day. In terms of disadvantages, well, obviously with a, a piece of technology flying in the sky, it's going to be heavily regulated. And that is fair to say, um, we're trying to run through some of those regulations today, but there are, they're, they're quite extensive and it really depends on your use and the type of drone you're using um, and where you're flying it. So I would encourage you to sort of visit the um, Civil Aviation Authority's website, which contains really good information on what you need to do around regulation. Although we are going to run through hopefully most of that today. Um, obviously as well, there's legal issues that arise out of the use of drones. Um, and in particular, um, the ones that we want to talk about today are the risk of nuisance, the risk of trespass, um, as you're capturing data with a drone, there's obviously data protection considerations, and we'll try and run through some of that today. And I suppose um, as well, when there's a risk of capturing um, uh, data on uh, individuals and, and persons, then there's a risk of invasion of privacy. And we'll hope to sort of uh, tackle some of those issues and how they can be avoided, avoided on a practical level today as well. So um, moving on to regulation. There's a very complicated history of regulation, even though the technology is relatively recent. Um, and as with many things, it's further complicated with Brexit. Um, although I would say that um, the EU regulations post-Brexit still continue to apply in the main. There is the Air Navigation Order 2016, which is the primary UK regulation. Um, However, um, in the event of any kind of um, uh, contradiction in the EU regulations and in the UK regulations, the EU regulations will apply because they were retained post-Brexit. Um, so from the 31st of December 2020, um, the Civil Aviation Authority regulates all unmanned aircraft operations in the, U in the UK. Uh, the only exception to that are state operations, such as the use in military police or, or customs. Um, for those of you invo involved in cross-border work as well, and specifically in the Republic of Ireland, um, UK drone qualifications, which we'll come on to discuss, won't be valid in the EU and the Republic of Ireland. You'll need to do the local version of the course there if that's a requirement of um, the type of drone operation that you're carrying out. Um, you'll also need to register with the uh, authority for use in that country in the Republic of Ireland. Um, the Irish Aviation Authority uh, regulates on behalf of the European Aviation Safety Agency. Um, so you'll need to register with them if you're involved in cross-border work. Um, but the regulations are basically the same um, between the UK and the EU, other than the uh, registration and course requirements. Um, and that is because most of the EU regulations were retained post-Brexit. So moving on, to uh, regulation. Um, I don't intend to go through these in detail today. They're extremely complex, um, but there's a few that I've tried to highlight as the main concepts you need to think about when operating drones. And in particular, we're going to go through the legal requirements on certification um, to allow your operation to take place. Um, so the rules are set down by the by the rules set down by the Civil Aviation Authority are no longer based on whether it's a commercial or a recreational activity. And um, that used to be the case. It's now a little bit more complex in terms of how they look at um, what you need to do when you're flying a drone. Um, and the rules are based on where you fly, your proximity to other people, and um, the risk caused to other people, and the size and weight of your drone. Um, there are basically three categories in which um, three categories of drones are split into three categories and that's based on risk. So the um, I, I suppose taking it in reverse order, let's look at certified first, because I actually think that this applies least to the construction industry and um, certified covers operations that present an equivalent risk to that of a manned aviation. So if you could think about a, a commercial aircraft, you know, and all the regulations that they would be subject to certified basically falls into that category. Um, it would 
cover drones where there's going to be an operation over assembly or a crowd of people, um, where there's going to be transport of people on the drone or where there's going to be carriage of dangerous goods. So it's probably applies the least in terms of the construction sector and the type of uses that you would want to use drones for. Um, what would be more relevant to the construction sector is the open and specific categories. Um, taking open first, um, open is basically the lowest risk category. Um, and as long as you stay within the parameters of the legislation and the certifications and the uh, uh, required, then there is no need to require, there's no need to get a specific operational authorization from the CAA. So what I mean by that is a specific uh, operational um, authorization for a specific flight. Um, that would be the case with a specific, which I'll come on to, but with a low, um, sorry, with an open uh, category, then um, there's no need for that. Uh, the specific category um, are what the CAA deems as presenting a greater risk, and it requires a specific operational authorization by the CAA only after submission of a risk assessment. Um, so, um, those are the those are the three overall categories. Sort of moving on to uh, our uh, our visual here, and um, this sort of gives you the main points of what might be deemed to be open, specific, or certified. So, as I said before, with open, there's no prior authorization necessary. Um, it covers recreational use in some instances, unless the drone is deemed to be effectively a toy or um, or uh, weighing less than a certain amount. Um, it's used by some commercial pilots and it's used where um, it's used for drones up to a maximum of 250 grams. Um, the maximum height that a drone can operate under the open category is 120 meters or 400 feet. Um, as well as that, there is a specific requirement that you keep within the visual, you keep the drone within the visual line of sight at all times. So that's the LOS, visual line of sight. Um, so this means that you keep your drone within sight um, at all times to ensure it doesn't collide with anything. Um, as well as that, you must maintain a safe distance from people and you must not fly within flight restricted zones or a protected aerodrome or other airspace restriction. I would say that that particular requirement, um, which applies throughout, um, is the most important to ensure that uh, you, you get that right. Um, because in terms of the prosecutions and things like that that have happened to date for dangerous drone use, it's usually around um, uh, flying over restricted airspace or aerodromes and things like that. Um, in terms of where you can find out the information as to what is a restricted airspace, um, <coughs> I would advise you visit the CAA website because they have links through to the Aeronautical Information Service website um, and they have, an inter they have a link to an interactive um, uh, Google map which shows the restricted airspace and uh, there's also a, an app called Drone Assist which provides an inter interactive map of the sky which might assist as well and um, so that's definitely one thing to look at uh, before you're planning a flight. Um, just to complicate matters slightly further within the open category before I move on to specific, um, there are three more subcategories within the open category. Um, that includes flying over people, flying close to people, and flying far away from people, and there are different rules that apply to each. So again, visit the CAA website and the regulations required if you're operating within the open category. Um, moving on to specific category, um, that would be a medium risk category uh, where, as I said before, you require a specific author operational authorization from the CAA after submission of a risk assessment. It covers any drones above 250 grams or um, and in terms of whether it would be a specific category drone um, I refer you to Annex B of um, a, a standard called CAP 722 and that gives you details of, of whether your operation would fall within this in specific. In, in terms of additional requirements under the specific category you must also complete a um, a GBC course, and that's a specific course run by the CAA, uh, a, gen a general visual line of sight course. Um, this satisfies the pilot competency requirements for a visual line of sight operation. 
Uh, it, the GBC is both a theoretical examination and a practical test flight, and it's run by CAA approved assessors. Um, BVLOS, so a, a, a beyond visual line of sight and um, with a specific category where you can't see the drone when you're operating it um, is possible, but it would be subject to specific um, approval. Um, so moving on to the next diagram. So that is just a visual layer to sort of briefly sum up whether it would be open, the requirements of open specific and certified. Um, so as you can see under the open category, it, it depends on the weight. Um, there's, a, there's restrictions on the maximum height required and it has to be a visual line of sight operation with the specific rules on A1, A2 and A3 there, depending on when you're flying over near or far from people. On the specific category then, um, there is no maximum height limits, but it'd be subject to approval. An operational authorization is required on, on submission of a risk assessment and a, vis a beyond visual line of sight is possible subject to approval. And I'll, I won't mention the certified again because I doubt that it falls very much within any of the activities of uh, anybody on the call today. So moving on. Okay, these are just some of the requirements on the open category in particular, um, although they apply to all really. Um, there's a general duty of care that all man unmanned aircraft must be flown in accordance with the general duty not to act rec recklessly or negligently, cause or permit an aircraft to endanger any person or property. Um, as I said before, um, it can't be flown more than 400 feet, 120 meters above the closest point on the Earth's surface unless permission has been obtained, obtained from the CAA. And there must be a visual line of sight um, maintained at all time. Um, I have been asked before whether um, monitoring a screen is enough for um, a visual line of sight operation. And it's not thought to be, you really have to have the drone within your sight in order to operate within this category. Okay, moving on to the next one. Okay, so in, in terms of the registration requirements, um, for both the open and specific categories, unless a drone is less than 250 grams and is either a toy or is unable to capture personal data in that it doesn't have a camera on board, um, the operator must be registered with the CAA um, to obtain an operator ID. And in order to do that, there is an online competency test to be um, obtained. Now it's not the same as the GBC course, which is a sort of an extra requirement to have a practical assessment. This is an online course. And, it's, and you're required to do it every three years. Um, so the remote pilot must pass an online competency test with the CAA to receive every three years to receive his flyer ID. Um, and just a quick note, the children under 18 can't obtain an operator ID, but they can obtain a flyer ID. Um, just a quick mention of the drone code. It is not um, really... Uh, used in commercial or or recommended for commercial, but it's it's quite a good document to refer to um, if you want sort of practical tips in terms of flying drones safely. So I've just mentioned that there as a resource, um, and also the Irish Aviation Authority and the Civil Aviation Authority as the UK and ROA um, regulatory bodies, which have all the sort of references and resources that you need if you're thinking about um, carrying out a drone operation. Okay, <laughs> moving on then to the legal risks on operating drones. Um, I'm just gonna set out a few of those today um, and some of the sort of uh, cases which have developed um, just for your background information. Um, I'm also gonna talk about some areas and, and some things you can do to sort of minimize your risk. And Connor's gonna specifically address that when it comes to um, construction use. So I suppose the most scary uh, prospect of using a drone incorrectly is any kind of criminal liability which arises um, and there are various offences and penalties set out in the regulations um, again I'm not going to go through all of them but just a few to highlight the first case where there was a prosecution on dangerous use of a drone was against a guy called Robert Knowles in 2014 uh, he flew a drone uh, in a restricted airspace over a nuclear facility and uh, too close to a vehicle bridge. Um, his fine was 800 pound and the costs were 3,500. Um, that was sort of closely followed by another case against a guy called Nigel Wilson. Um, now he actually carried out um, repeated drone offences, nine in total. 
uh, flying over the Houses of Parliament and football stadiums. He had a fine of uh, £1,800, cost of, of £600, but he was also subject to restrictions preventing him from bas basically purchasing or owning drones again. Um, and there are various fixed penalty notices for less serious offences up to £100. Um, a few of the criminal uh, provisions to sort of bear in mind, as I said before, flying over restricted airspace or an aerodrome is, is a pretty big one. Um, and non-compliance with that particular regulation under Part 2, Schedule 13 um, can land you with a summary conviction fine of up to £2,500. Um, and then non-compliance with Part 3, Schedule 13, uh, which includes endangering safety of person or property. That's a summary conviction with a fine or imprisonment of up to two years or both. So that's an even um, more serious offence and something to bear in mind. Moving on to civil liability, um, there, are, there are sort of various sort of limbs of civil liability which could arise from the use of drones. Um, I'm going to try and briefly cover four of those today, trespass, nuisance, negligence, and data protection and privacy. Um, so, I mean, the Civil Aviation Act 1982 deals with liability for damage by, caused by aircraft, including drones. Um, it states that it's an offence to... Um, to have a flight in, um, in contravention of the air navigation order. Um, and it's, it, there's a strict liability offence for uh, surface damage caused by a drone. That would be a material loss or damage caused to a person or property. So in this instance, um, the, it's a strict liability offence and uh, it, it doesn't matter of intention or whether you, know, you didn't intend to be negligent, you're actually, um, you, you'd be found liable for uh, damages if you cause material loss or damage to a person or property. Um, so just a sort of a quick note to say that if you're using a third party drone operator, it's probably important in those circumstances to have a, a proper indemnity in your contract and um, that they would indemnify any loss caused as a result of their use, which um, contravened the Civil Aviation Act 1982. Um, and to the, it would be important to also ensure that they have sort of correct insurance in place for that as well. Um, so. Moving on then to data protection and privacy, first of all. Um, well, um, it's inevitable that drones raise issues with regard to data protection because they're fitted with a recording device, device which uh, retains images. So because of that, uh, the use of drones definitely falls within the UK GDPR regime, both the EU GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. Um, in terms of how the Information Commissioner's Office treats drones and provides advice on drones, um, they refer you to the CCTV code on their website. Um, and although there are subtle differences between the operation of drones and the CCTV code, um, it's definitely a good point of reference um, to ensure that you're, if you operate in, in accordance with the CCTV code, then um, you're likely to uh, sort of minimize your risk in terms of any kind of breach of data protection obligations. So starting with the first principle of, um, of data protection, like what is, what is personal data? It's any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And um, there has to be consideration of what uh, the image is used for. <clears throat> if you think about the kind of images that drones could uh, capture and, you know, it's capturing people at a distance as well, but with the ability to zoom in, say on their face, um, so it could be an individual's face, it could be information which allows an individual to be identified, such as a car number plate, a house number or a uniform. It could even be bodily characteristics such as tattoos or any kind of signage which could identify the person's uh, personal or professional life. It's not enough to say, however, that just because you can zoom into a person's face and identify them, that that is personal data which you're, you have retained in contravention to the Data Protection Act. You have to also take account of what the image is used for. Uh, for example, it would be a greater risk if the footage uh, obtained by the drone particularly focused on an individual 
or was was going to be used to make decisions about an individual um and i would suggest in the construction industry and in the use that you um are the, the way you're, you're using drones it would be very very unlikely that um an individual an individual would be a focus of your footage it would just be sort of an ancillary um uh, a byproduct if you like of using the uh, the drone um, so there's also a question of who qualifies as a data controller and a data processor. So that would be very much depend on your own operation and whether you're using uh, outsourcing to a third party. Um, but again, you should ensure that if you're outsourcing to a third party, that all the usual data protection obligations are, are contained within your contract. Um, with any uh, data protection considerations, you have to comply with the main data protection principles of lawfulness, fairness, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality, and accountability. Um, in terms of practical tips uh, we would give in order to sort of minimize any risk of breach of data protection um, after data capture by, by drone, um, uh, sort of bear in mind the following things on the slide there. Is it necessary to use a high quality recording equipment? Um, if it's not necessary for your operation, then you might consider using one which has uh, less risk of uh, obtaining sharp images. Um, you should also ensure that your recording equipment can be switched on and off remotely. So, for example, if you think about uh, an instance where you're maybe carrying out a roof survey um, and you're rising up the drone beyond a building through the windows, it's not really necessary to have the drone's camera on as, they, as the drone uh, ascends. Um, and then turn it on, on only when it reaches the roof. And that way you will capture images of people, you know, through windows or anything like that. Um, you should avoid the use of audio recording where possible. Um, that is not often necessary. Um, and it's quite harder uh, to justify the use of audio uh, in terms of privacy considerations. And the ICO certainly recommend where possible, don't use audio in their CCTV code. In terms of retaining data, you should also consider using anonymization uh, techniques such as the blurring of faces and um, things like that if you're processing data or retaining it for any purpose. Um, you should always plan the flight and try to mi minimize the risk of passing over people. Uh, make, make sure your operator of the drone also stays in sight well marked and um, maybe with a high vis vest on um, and um, so that the individual knows that they can be contacted if they think there's any kind of covert surveillance going on so that they can be reassured on that point. Um, where possible, um, limit the number of people um, that, you're, that you capture um, and uh, also confirm that you uh, keep the data safe. Okay, so moving on to trespass. Um, it's always been a, a sort of thorny question as to whether um, having or you know um occupying the space above someone's head can be can amount to trespass and um, the case law itself has changed as to whether a land over owner is entitled to a vertical column of air up to the sky and uh, that was thrown in doubt because if you think about it then every time a satellite pot passes over airspace then that could theoretically be a trespass um, so the rule is therefore that you balance the rights of the landowner against the normal rights of the public. Um, my conclusion from this is that uh, a reasonable height should be acceptable, but best practice is, and particularly where it's not a, a, an operation flying over an, a number of people or a number of gardens, that you should always, where possible, have permission of the landowner before flying over their land. Okay, so... Moving on then to nuisance. Um, nuisance is effectively an interference with the use or enjoyment of an individual's land that causes injury in relation to the ownership of land. This is very much a developing area of law. There's no test case yet on whether uh, a, a drone can amount, the use of a drone can amount to a nuisance. Um, however, if you think about it on a practical level, I would say repeated low level flights using recording commitment equipment might be deemed to be a nuisance, whereas one continuous flight uh, for one purpose may not be. Um, you, can, you should consider all the time as to whether the, act, the uh, activity causes noise pollution, polluting smoke or uh, constant surveillance. So 
A few other risks to be aware of. Obviously, drones are technology, and just like any other technology, they're vulnerable to hacking um, or drone jacking. Um, in any way with technology, you should ensure you keep your software updated and implement security patches. Um, there is a requirement for insurance for uh, all um, drone operations, um, except for those for recreational purposes under 20 kg. So at all times you should have insurance cover. Um, I've just briefly mentioned confidentiality as a potential risk there, and it's sort of aligned to privacy, but you know, you could think about uh, circumstances where uh, the duty of confidentiality might be employed, um, such as if you were passing a drone over a, a closed set and filming, or um, if there was any kind of circumstances which could, uh, which would sort of uh, support um, a particular privacy concern, um, then you should always be aware of the duty of confidentiality as well. So that's all of um, the risks that I wanted to outline. I'm going to pass over to Connor, my colleague now, who will specifically talk about the construction industry and um, what he sees are um, the particular risks and, and uh, practical tips arising. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. I've had to rejoin on my phone. Of course, my computer said to reboot now and there was no other option but, <laughs> but to reboot. So. Luckily, I've been back on just on time. Um, but drone technology is really taken off in the modern construction industry. Um, it can be seen across a variety of engineering and infrastructure projects. And construction has been tipped as the biggest user of commercial drones in the coming years. And with that, I thought it'd be important today to focus on two of the more crucial factors of drone tech in construction. And that's going to be how these drones are being used and the impact of that use. So I've included on screen here some of the main uses that we're seeing um, of drone technology in the construction industry. Progress monitoring of site works and operations is a common use of drone tech on construction projects. Um, many of the latest drone systems incorporate real-time monitoring for enhanced security in the moment evaluation response and planning. Drones make the production of weekly progress maps quicker, easier, and most importantly, less costly, which is what everyone wants to hear than, than traditional methods. And they also facilitate greater and easier information exchanges between construction companies, and that boosts overall efficiency and communication. Site survey and measurement is perhaps the main use of the drone by contractors and developers. Accessibility and accuracy are helping drones to establish their role in surveying and measuring. Footage or detailed pictures of the lay of the land are invaluable on any construction project, no matter how big or how small. And footage from initial surveys can help inform impact assessments and provide historical records. Drones are greatly reducing the labor and time involved in producing traditional, in traditional surveys. By eliminating much of the humour and error involved in the process and having that ability to capture the necessary data in much less time than traditional methods, drone tech really is leading from the front when it comes to site survey. The unmanned aspect of a UAV holds particular relevance on construction sites. So, you know, like any areas that's you know a bit too risky or too dangerous to send in personnel. So, like that could just be a really high structure or maybe an area where there's hazardous material, that's gonna present you know, an alternative to, to use a drone as a safer option. In 2016 and 2017, falls on site were the second highest cause of fatalities in the UK construction industry. So keeping workers on the ground and sending the drones up can contribute to overall worker safety and risk management. And similarly, where areas are completely inaccessible, drones can be used to get to that area and where there's uncertainty about safety issues, drone tech is being used to save time as well as minimize risk. And just more generally speaking, drones come into play across all stages of a construction project. And that includes your bidding process, the design stage, um, on-site work and project handover. Initial surveys 
can help determine if projects are feasible and that can enhance project briefing and tender processes. The wealth of data from drone tech allows greater design capabilities in accordance with on the ground site conditions. And once construction is underway, you know, when the shovels hit the ground, drones are being used to track progress, enhance communication, improve safety, and create a useful paper trail, which is exactly what your solicitor is going to want to see. And upon project handover, drone data, such as, you know, even a photo or a video can prove as really good marketing material to better advertise and promote your work. And it's that well-balanced and well-rounded nature of drone tech that's really proved useful to most contractors and developers. So what impact is this use of drones having on the construction industry? Well, you know, anyone will tell you how commonplace project conflicts are. Given the complexity of projects nowadays with all the specialized professions, the possibilities for disputes are huge. You know, especially coming out of the pandemic, like we're seeing a lot of adjudications and other dispute resolution processes being launched. And the digitization of work sites can help manage and resolve that conflict. Drone data in particular is being used more and more as a tool for dispute resolution. Advances in drone technology has allowed the construction industry to track progress, catch errors before dispute even arises, and maintain accurate records for evidence. Timestamp surveys can prove vital in a delay claim. Surveys can also iron out you know, any inconsistencies with matters such as the site itself um, to avoid conflict later down the line. And drone data, it's, it's more accurate and it's more reliable than traditional record keeping methods. So if you find yourself in the process of litigation, drone data is gonna prove as really vital evidence on any construction dispute. And just as an example, um, if a client is trying to blame you for conditions that existed before your team began working, an initial timestamp survey from a drone is going to help you prove them wrong. But of course, like there's obviously going to be the possibility that no matter how good your argument is, no compromise can be reached. And drone data is still going to be really valuable here because it will prove as powerful evidence in any court battle. Given their accuracy, a great degree of reliability can be placed on drone evidence. Drone technology, it's, it's a low risk, high reward investment. And there's been a predicted 8.6 billion pounds uplift in GDP in the construction sector by 2030 due to the incorporation of drones. The continued growth of the technology right into now in, in 2022 means that the sooner drones are implemented on your projects and business, the quicker you will realize like, the short term, but also the long term benefits of this technology. And get, getting ahead of the game now, so you know your employees are used to and efficient with this technology, it's only going to help you in the long run when this technology really further advances and takes over. And that low risk of small financial investment, compliance and adherence with the relevant regulations will undoubtedly pay dividends in the future. Previously, surveying and data collection had to strike a balance between speed and accuracy. So developers had to decide, you know, whether to spend days or even weeks covering land for accurate data, or alternatively, sacrifice accuracy for a speedier survey. Whereas with drone use, data collection, it's a lot faster, it's more precise, and it's overall more efficient. And those are three things that are vital on any construction project and linked directly to the heart of any construction dispute, time and money. And as I previously mentioned, using drones to access awkward or previously inaccessible areas, or even just great heights, has had a fantastic impact on construction projects from a health and safety perspective. Employee and staff safety is paramount, and that should be at the forefront of any employer's agenda. Any potential to reduce such a risk you know, it's not only beneficial, but it's crucial on a construction project. And there will, of course, remain a few challenges. You know, many of them have already been highlighted by Emma, like sourcing a competent pilot or the privacy and misuse issues. And of course, you know, even the fact that the regulatory change has struggled to keep up with the advances in the technology. And that's why 
combining the use of drone tech on your projects with the right legal advice can help them run smoothly, avoid disputes, even or ease them if they do arise, and ultimately benefit all parties involved. So to round off, it's clear that drone tech has really revolutionized the construction industry right from you know project inception to completion and i've included um, on the screen here some key takeaway tips from today's discussion the biggest takeaway you know has to be just put simply reduce your risk comply with the relevant rules and regulations that emma delved into you know that's your first protocol knowing the regulations adhering to them it's the only and best way to implement drone use and of course the best person to keep you right is going to be your solicitor. And as I said before, you know, regulatory change it has struggled to keep up with the advances in this technology. But having said that, the change does still happen. And this is a niche and fluid area of law that, you know, it requires a good bit of monitoring of the legislation. And despite that demand, there's a distinct lack of drone law experts in Northern Ireland. Mill Selig is the go-to law firm in NI for drone legal advice. And when you couple that with our expertise in other practice areas like construction, litigation, energy, and even media, you know, we're offering an all under one roof approach for your business and project needs. And another, another key tip would be safety first, as simple as that. A safe operation is gonna be a good operation. You know, safety should be at the forefront of any drone flight because once that drone is airborne, you're vulnerable to risk. And, you know, not only the staff, like I'm talking general public, passers-by, as well as even the risk to property damage, you know, the neighbouring buildings, um, even your own site structure. <laughs> and then obviously the risk of damage to the drone itself. So you don't want to be pumping all this money into buying new drones every time you fly them you're, because you're crashing them. You know, so just simply, uh, you know, establishing the right safety protocol and putting them in, in place help avoid reckless or careless flying. Because the opportunity for things to go wrong are abundant and can lead, you know, to all sorts like damaged company reputation, um, increased operating costs or even project delay. And as Emma said, you're going to need an authorized and competent pilot depending on what category your drone falls into. From a regulatory and legal standpoint, it's non-negotiable. Um, so it's worth considering now who at your company ought to be that designated pilot or if recruitment is needed. I would also advise to conduct a privacy risk assessment before undertaking to use drone technology. This will help identify and reduce the risk of privacy issues on projects involving personal data. And I'd also suggest that you gain employee consent before introducing drones to the building site. Informing staff you know, of how their personal data is processed is gonna be key because any covert you know, spying on employees or subcontractors is gonna be unlawful. And it's also important to come up with ways of providing individuals with notice that the drone is in use. So, you know, I would simply just recommend, you know, wear some high vis equipment that clearly identifies you as the drone operator or the drone pilot. And you can even place some signs, you know, ar around the area um, if necessary. And just as a final takeaway tip, I know from experience that we're seeing many construction contracts, including provision for drone use. So if you don't have the technology readily available or you're not proficient with it, you're going to be on the back foot when it comes to tendering for new contracts or entering new construction projects and schemes. So I think that's maybe one to take away and think about. And that's, that's really it from me today, folks. Um, thanks very much for your time. I hope that was useful. And hopefully, unlike the drones, that didn't go over anyone's head. I'll pass back to Emma. <laughs> Um, thanks, Connor. Um, yeah, are there any um, questions? We'll just give it a minute, maybe if anybody wants to pop an hang into the chat box. If you don't have anything right now, and um, 
you think of something after, uh, feel free to email in to, to David who can pass it on to us and we'd be happy to address it. It is a fairly sort of technical and complex regulatory area. So um, I know there was a lot to absorb there and uh, something might occur to you later on. So, so no problem if you want to email questions in to David. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and, and Emma and Connor, um, thank you for, for putting that all together. But well, there is actually just one thing just from me, and it's just just probably on what, on what, on what Connor was saying there. I, I'm assuming from what you're saying then that over the last number of years on the dispute side of things, you've seen a lot more of the evidential basis being partially coming from drones and what drones are providing in that, in that, in that set, set sense of the dispute. Yeah, well, even just, I think it's just the fact that drones are more modern. So with the fact that everything's sort of digitized and on your computer, the, the evidence is going to be there. There's going to be a record of it. Whereas, you know, previously, if people were on site visiting a site and writing things down, for example, you know, you can see that sort of evidence that tends to go missing. Um, so I think that that's just really boosted drones appeal as evidence in you know any disputes and especially just like I was saying that that's sort of the the time stamp of when that drone was flown you can prove dates and then even even more specifically the actual time on the day of like site conditions or um you know you know that that sort of thing to kind of if to kind of counter any argument if if you're getting blamed for you know like I was saying like any any on the site conditions Okay, okay. Um, just a couple of things for you. So we will share the slides later. Trevor, uh, Trevor Conway just put that question in. Um, and there's a couple of questions that are coming through there around the police element of it, Emma. If you've, if you've seen those, don't know whether you want to comment on those. Yeah, so uh, the question is, if there's a drone breaking the rules, should the PSNI be the first point of contact? Uh, your first point of contact is actually a civil aviation authority because they are the regulator and they enforce the rules. Ultimately, if there's a prosecution, they may refer it to uh, the police, but there is an online form if you go to the CAA website to report drone misuse to them in the first instance. Um, and then there's another question. If challenged or requested, should a drone pilot provide their license details? Yes, um, that those, those should be available and on display. Okay. Don't know whether there's any follow up on the back of those. If there is, you know, please feel free to 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 get in touch um, uh, either again in the next sort of thirty seconds or so, perhaps, or 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 by or by uh, or by email. Um, and I don't know whether there's anybody else has any questions. If not, I suppose we'll just bring it to a close now. Once again, just to say thank you to Emma and Connor for your time today and sharing this detailed presentation with us. We'll share the slides with you in advance. This has also been recorded, so it'll be available on our YouTube channel. And um, yes, just to thank you very much again for your time. And we look forward to the next one in the series with Bill Selleck, who we enjoy very much working with. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.